Paul graduated from Haas with an MBA. It was 1996. Two years later, he launched Fair Trade USA, which certifies everything from coffee to cocoa to seafood as the leading certifier of fair trade products in all of North America. People called Paul crazy in the early days of fair trade. But from his 11 years organizing farmers in the highlands of Nicaragua, he knew, he knew what other people didn't, that farmers and workers played a critical role in their own journey out of poverty. By purchasing products with the fair trade certified label, U.S. consumers have helped generate over $500 million dollars in additional income for farmers and workers in 70 countries. That's allowed them to keep their children in school, care for their environment, and steadily improve their livelihoods. Paul is a four-time winner of the Fast Company Social Capitalist of the Year Award. He's the recipient of the prestigious Skoll Award for Social Entrepreneurship. Paul has spoken at the World Economic Forum, the Clinton Global Initiative, the Skoll World Forum, TEDx Talks, and numerous universities and conferences around the world. He is a true Berkeley leader who demonstrates the power of a Berkeley MBA degree and its role in deeply changing other people's lives. Please join me in a warm welcome for Paul Rice. Thank you, Dean Lyons, for that kind and generous introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. There we go. Is the MBA class of 2018 in the house? So I heard a rumor about y'all. I heard that you were the smartest, coolest graduating class ever. Is that right? So hopefully this will be the smartest, coolest commencement speech ever, right? Seriously, I am so grateful to be here and so proud of you all. As Rich said, I've been through the program myself. I know how challenging it is. I know how stressful it can be at times. And so I just want to commend you all for your hard work, for your perseverance. And I want to echo what Dean Lyons said, we would not be here today if not for our family, our friends, our support network who made it possible. So the honor that you're receiving today is for all of them as well. Let's show our appreciation. <laughs> By the way, with the evening and weekend MBA graduates, please make some noise. You guys deserve special props, special respect, right? I mean, you're working. You're out there working your job, and you decide to get an MBA kind of in your spare time? I mean, that's crazy commitment right there. And I can relate. My mama was a single mom. She went back to school when I was just a kid. She went all the way through. She got her bachelor's, her master's, her PhD, all the while working and raising me and my sisters. She was the original Wonder Woman. She had a superpower, and I see that superpower in you. And I'm so grateful for the example that you all have set for your kids and for us all. I have to say something about Dean Rich Lyons. Rich has been such an incredible leader here in the Haas community. Over the last 11 years, under his leadership, we've raised record amounts of resources for the school. We've built a new building. We've codified and really cemented our core values and our culture with the defining leadership principles. I just saw a study that says that the number one reason why you all came here was because of the culture, because of the values of this school. I dare say that is probably Rich's greatest legacy, is really bringing us together with a strong common bond of values and culture. And so Rich, on behalf of the entire Haas community, I want to express our profound admiration and our heartfelt gratitude for everything that you've done for us and for our community.
right, so I have a confession. I was really nervous about this speech. So I got on YouTube and I started walking out and I watched a whole bunch of, bunch of commencement speeches. And the more I watched, the more I realized that the common thread through all of them is that commencement speakers like to give out life advice. They like to give advice. And as, as I watched these cheesy prescriptions, I realized that I'm not gonna do that today. You guys are way too smart and way too talented and have so much promise and potential. The last thing you need is for me to get up here and give you advice about your lives. So I'm not gonna do that. Question the status quo, right? I'm gonna do something else. I'm going to share some reflections that I have about this moment in history and about the opportunities and the obligations that face us all. And I'm gonna get serious for a minute because the world is in trouble. The world is in trouble. And look, you know, it's strange because if you look at the data around economic growth around the world over the last 50 years, you have to conclude that this has been a remarkable period in history. We've seen dramatic economic growth in even the poorest countries in the world. And yet, we also have so much data that proves now that the benefits of that economic growth are not trickling down to the poorest of the poor. Literally billions of people are being left behind by globalization. The numbers are numbing. World Bank studies, UN studies, academia, here's what they say. Today, two billion people are trying to survive on $2 a day. We have 800 million people that go hungry on a regular basis. We have 800 million people that don't have access to clean water. We have 263 million kids of school age who can't go to school because of their poverty. We have 25 million people today that are victims of trafficking and modern day slavery. And that's just on the social side. On the environmental side, we're cutting down 20 million acres of forest every year. It has a huge impact on global warming. I just saw the, the NASA's latest study on climate change. Climate change is accelerating, and we don't have a handle on it. Now, I'm sorry to bring such bad news to a day of joy and celebration, but we got to keep it real. This is the world we face. And this data for me is a compelling and powerful call to action for our entire generation. Perhaps the survival of our species depends on it. Now I would argue that the old approaches to these problems are not working fast enough or big enough. In, in the past, we would look to government. We would look to government regulation or public policy, or we would look to well-intentioned nonprofit organizations to tackle problems like poverty and environmental destruction. And they still have a role, but their solutions are not coming fast enough. So I believe it is time now for business to step up. It's time for business to bring the incredible entrepreneurial spirit and the creativity and the talent and the resources to bear on the world's most intractable problems. And my paper's blown away. Honestly, I came to this conclusion during my years in Nicaragua. I went there as an idealistic 22-year-old. I wanted to work with farmers. I worked on a number of different agricultural development projects for years helping farmers improve their yields in order to improve their income. And these projects are typical of international aid. They, they uh, were, were well designed by very smart experts around the, the world and, and we had millions of dollars to invest in alleviating poverty. But honestly, y'all, it didn't work. We failed to develop a sustainable economic development process in the communities. Despite our good intentions and despite the, 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 the funding, this top-down approach so often doesn't work. 
I had a chance to pivot in 1990. I started Nicaragua's first farmer-owned export, coffee export cooperative. And over a couple of years, we brought together 3,000 families, and our farmers were delivering their coffee to a central mill. We processed the coffee, we added value, and we exported direct. And as a result of this business model, we were able to get a dramatically higher price back to our farmers for all their hard work. And that, in turn, allowed us to do amazing things in our communities. Our farmers were able to put food on the table. They were able to keep their kids in school. In fact, we built schools. We launched health care programs. We dug wells to drink, bring clean drinking water into our villages for the first time. We set up microcredit programs targeting women so that women could develop their own businesses and their own economic independence. We taught our farmers to go organic. We reforested thousands of acres of land that had been deforested. And here's the punchline. We did all of this, all of this social and, and environmental progress, not thanks to the good wishes or the goodwill of a government agency or an international agency. We did it thanks to business. We did it thanks to this market-based approach that harnessed the entrepreneurial energy of our farmers. So it, it seems to me that that is the challenge. How do we harness the power of business to the task of tackling the world's problems? My experience in Nicaragua changed me profoundly, and it's what brought me back to Haas. It made me want to take that small experience in Nicaragua and scale it up. And I have to say that the Berkeley Haas MBA was a big part of me being able to do that. So here's, thank you. So here's the good news. I see a more enlightened era of capitalism emerging. Many business leaders call this conscious capitalism or business with purpose. But what we're seeing is a fundamental shift in which companies are bringing values and sustainability into their cultures and into their strategies. And I think this shift reflects a real change, a real, uh, a real change in, in the thinking of business leaders around sustainability. I think in the past, most business leaders saw sustainability and responsibility as being at odds with profitability. Either you pursued sustainability or you tried to maximize profits for shareholders, but you couldn't do both. My dear friend and, and mentor Dave Sherman calls this trade-off mentality. But what I see happening today is the evolving re realization that sustainability and profitability can go together. Smart business leaders, purpose-driven business leaders, are actually proving that sustainability can drive long-term success for the firm, that it can drive long-term shareholder value. And this realization isn't just among the pioneers, people like John Mackey of Whole Foods or Ben & Jerry's or Yvonne Chouinard at Patagonia. Increasingly, we're seeing some of the biggest business leaders, some of the biggest companies in the world embracing this philosophy. So Paul Pullman, for example, CEO of Unilever. Unilever has been working on climate change and human rights, on sustainable agricultural supply chains, and at the same time, their business is thriving. Indra Nooyi, the CEO of PepsiCo, launched her Performance with Purpose initiative a few years ago. As part of that, they sought to reduce their environmental footprint. PepsiCo just announced that in the pursuit of this effort, they just saved the company $600 million over the last five years. So social and environmental value and, and financial value can go together. They're showing that. Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock. I don't know if you all saw that. He put out a, a, a public letter a few months ago. BlackRock is the largest hedge, hedge fund in the world with $6 trillion. And Larry Fink said that BlackRock is going to start evaluating companies, not just based on financial performance, but also based on social impact. So clearly, <laughs> clearly this is a new day. We also find companies increasingly taking a public stand on the issues of the day and on their values. I just saw a commercial last week, a TV commercial. Budweiser had a, a, a commercial that talked about equal pay for women. And look at all the brands that have cut ties with the NRA in the aftermath of the Parkland school shooting. <laughs> the, 
United Airlines, Delta Airlines, Hertz, MetLife, all these companies have cut their special programs with the NRA. And after today's tragic shooting at a school in Houston, I dare say a lot more brands are going to join this issue and take a stand. One of my, one of my uh, favorite examples is uh, Patagonia. So on Black Friday 2016, Patagonia announced that it was going to donate 100% of its online sales revenue to nonprofits that were doing work on climate change. Normally, Patagonia would have sold between $1 and $2 million worth of product online on Black Friday. That year, they sold $10 million worth of product. And they donated it all to charity. And what it showed is that when companies do the right thing, we as consumers are inclined to support them and to reward them. And that gives me a lot of hope. So clearly it is no longer taboos, it is no longer taboo for companies to take a stand on controversial issues, and it's no longer taboo for companies to boldly state their values. In fact, I would argue that brands are increasingly looking to forge lifelong relationships with their customers, and so they're going beyond talking about product features. They're looking to forge a connection based on shared cultural values. So that's the opportunity we have as purposeful business leaders to tap into that. So, you know, I, I think it's a harder job to drive sustainability into the business model, and I want to come back to that for just a second, because the challenge we all face is how do we make the business case for sustainability, for doing the right thing? And I face this every day in, in, in the fair trade movement. I had a conversation with Doug McMillan, the CEO of Walmart, a couple of weeks ago, Walmart is now launching a whole line of fair trade and organic products. And I called him to thank him. And Doug said to me, we're, we're, we're proud to do this, but the only way that we can grow the program, the only way that we can scale it, is if you can show that fair trade is creating value in terms of supply chain security and, and, and in terms of sales of the product. There has to be a business case. And so I think that's the challenge for us all, to create sustainable business models that grow the pie, not that redistribute the pie, but that grow the pie, borrowing from Michael Porter's theory of shared value, that grow the pie in a way that serves both companies, the environment, and, and the communities in our supply chains. Now, I've touched a bit on consumer behavior, and my final point is about that. It's about conscious consumerism. You know, in the past, when we would go shopping, looking for products, we would really only care about three things, right? Quality, price, and price. But in growing numbers, we're now starting to ask more. We're asking, where does my stuff come from? Is it safe? Is it healthy? Is it sustainable? Is there child labor in my chocolate bar? Is there deforestation in these products? We're starting to ask the questions. None of us wants to feel like our shopping decisions are doing harm in the world. None of us want to feel like we're hurting the farmers or the workers that made those products. And so we're starting to educate ourselves. We're starting to read the label. We're starting to shop more responsibly. The conscious consumer may still be a, a small percentage of the total population, depending on whose research you believe. It's between 20 and 40 percent of adult American shoppers who are regularly looking for products that are more sustainable and responsible. But the data also indicates that this is a macro trend, because millennials index very high in terms of their expectations of companies and their practices. Millennials expect companies to be more responsible, to be more sustainable, to protect the environment and, and to serve society. And so clearly conscious consumerism is a wave of the future. And what we've seen is that when companies offer more sustainable and responsible products and when they tell the story, consumers step up. We step up, we buy more, and we reward them with our loyalty. And it kind of makes sense, right? I mean, we live in a time when so many of us are completely frustrated with the political process. 
no matter where you land on the political spectrum, there are so many of us that are so frustrated with the political process who don't believe that our voice is heard, who feel like our vote really isn't making a difference. So people are hungry for easy ways to make a difference, to feel like they're doing the right thing. And guess what? We all shop, right? We all eat. We all wear clothes. Except some crazy neighbors of mine down the street here in Berkeley. But most of us wear clothes. So what, ama what an amazing thought that we can vote for a better world with our shopping dollars. That with the things that we choose to purchase and the businesses that we choose to support, with the things that we choose to purchase and the businesses that we choose to support, we can support a better world. What an incredible thought that with something as simple as a cup of coffee, we can reach halfway across the world and help a coffee farming family keep their kids in school. I mean, that's powerful, powerful stuff. And I believe that it has captured the imagination of millions and millions of Americans. It's what's driving the conscious consumer movement, and it's what gives me hope. So here's my parting thought. The world desperately needs you. The world of your children desperately needs you. And never has there been more opportunity for a generation of purposeful business leaders to go out and make a difference. You know, we are a very special tribe, our Berkeley Haas community bound by common values, bound by a culture of service, bound by a commitment to leave the world better than the way we found it. Now you have the knowledge, the tools, and the network to do just that. And I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you. Thank you.